Massive Tyranid rules today, seems that we've got the profile for every single Tyranid unit in the new Leviathan box, let's talk through all of them, from the smallest Ripper to the biggest Screamer Killer, and the abomination multi-threat horror that is the Neuro Tyrant. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Tyranids, and in this video we're going to review all of the data sheets in the Tyranid Leviathan box set. Now Games Workshop has finally stopped just teasing us individual stats and giving us the whole data sheets to look at. A few bits are known, but there's really quite a lot of cool new stuff here. It's fun to see how these units will actually work on the board. This one's a fairly big rules drop for the bugs from beyond. We do have all the data sheets from the Leviathan box, including Rippers despite not being able to field a full score of them. But apparently we're really not going to be too far behind that from the full index for the Tyranids. Sounds like that we're getting that Invasion, Swarm and all the rest of the Tyranid data sheets later in the week. Currently though, we just have a bit of a teaser of the Vanguard of the Swarm. This one's just the data sheets from the Leviathan box. There's no stratagems or faction rule here, and there's no points cost yet. Games Workshop really do seem to be committing to keeping them till last. Still though, it gives us a great idea as to how the models in the box will function. For the Tyranids, we have seen a couple of data sheets so far. The Screamer Killer and the Termagants were both previewed, plus we saw a fair few stats in their online battle report, but most of the data sheets up to now haven't been revealed yet. I guess it's possible that a couple of these might actually gain additional options when we get full data sheets for them in the codex maybe. Kinda depends if they have a full multi-part plastic kit with other options. It does at least look like there's a few models that have different options to the ones in the Leviathan box, namely the Termagants and Rippers. In any case, let's talk through the box and see what this swarm can do in game. First up, let's start with the little guys. Ripper swarms are alive and well as their own unit still. I was wondering whether we'd see a full data sheet with Leviathan or not, given that there's only two in the box, so you can't field a full squad. I guess you'd have to pair these with another base from somewhere else, otherwise I guess they can just be the decoration for other bases of Tyranids maybe. Stats wise, they're not so dissimilar from before. Four wounds with a 6 plus save. They have dropped to toughness 2 though, so they're even more squishable with things like las guns. And also a bit unusually, their objective control 0 as well, meaning that they can't hold points. I think that's a bit of a blow to be honest, as in general being a nuisance unit that could claim objectives was one of their better roles. I feel like being objective control 0 is going to make them super niche to be honest. They'll still be interesting enough deep strike screeners perhaps, but you're not going to be able to drop them on a far flung objective and claim it for your swarm. Maybe putting them at a bit of a disadvantage compared with other Tyranid cheap chaff units. Otherwise, compared with their 9th edition data sheets, their melee has got a little bit better. They're still not exactly doing much, hitting on a 5 plus with a strength of 2, but I guess at least they get 6 attacks now. I guess they in theory might not do too terribly with that lethal hits high fleet adaptation. At least you could get a few guaranteed wounds there, even if it is AP0. From the army construction side, it looks like those spine wars are an optional upgrade as well. I guess a few more points to equip a fairly little and inaccurate pistol attack. The Spine Moors are a pistol 6 inch weapon with 4 shots, hitting on a 5 and strength 3. I suspect not really going to be worth it unless they're ridiculously cheap. I feel like for tiny disruption units like the Rippers, you're probably just best off keeping them as cheap as you possibly can. Finally, the Ripper special rule is Chitinous Horrors. When you're within engagement range of the enemy, you half the objective control of models in that unit, so I guess it means they're okay to pair with another Tyranid unit in your army, trying to fight over an objective. I guess if this ever does flip a point from the enemies to your control, it'll be super helpful. In reality though, I feel like you need to orchestrate a whole bunch of things for that ever to take effect. Both the Rippers and the Tyranid unit must survive. The enemy unit's got to survive your attacks. The Rippers have got to survive in close combat and make their charge in the first place, I guess. And then even beyond that, either your opponent might still win the objective, or you might have won it anyway. I think it's just a bit too niche to be really worth thinking about too hard. If they're ridiculously cheap, I guess they might not be too bad. In reality though, I think that they're going to struggle to be particularly effective in 10th edition, even if they are. Objective control 0 isn't good, their rules are a bit niche, and even against light infantry they might struggle for damage. Maybe a slightly disappointing data sheet overall, though quite fun new models. Next up, and here to cause a whole bunch of carnage, is the updated Screamer Killer profile. This was one of the early ones that Games Workshop teased. Really quite a hulking brute of a thing this, with toughness 9, a 2 plus save and 10 wounds, so really quite tanky. An 8 inch move, a good ranged scream attack with strength 8 and damage 1, and some massive talons with 10 attacks at strength 10 and damage 3 in combat. The latter is definitely the most impressive thing on the datasheet. 10 attacks at damage 3 is just a very scary profile all around. Looks like these things don't have any built in options anymore, you could have some upgrades for them I believe on the previous Tyranid datasheet, and also you can't take them in broods either. You are just going to be fielding these as single models now apparently. The Scream Attack does look quite useful at clearing out hordes, 
It's got the assault keyword, which means that you can still fire it even if you're advancing towards the enemy. Really quite nice that there's no conflict there between trying to get as close as possible and firing your gun. And the blast keyword might double down usefulness against really quite big hordes. If you scream at a unit as well, you can also have a chance for causing some battle shock, and you take a minus one penalty to this. Stopping stratagems on a unit could be pretty big, and it seems to work pretty nicely with the Neuro Tyrant, though it might not always matter for things like objectives, seeing as the opponent will heal it in their command phase, basically, and shouldn't affect fallback either. Definitely a really scary melee profile, though. In theory, you average around about two or three dead Space Marine Terminators. They really don't want to be fighting this thing. Next up, we've got the all-consuming beast that is the Psychophage. Again, really quite a fun model, this one. Great big tick like Tyranid with a massive great big maw. And seems like it's found a little bit of Space Marine to chow down on. The Psychophage looks like it's going to be a tankier bug compared with a damage dealer bug. It's toughness 9, a 3 plus save and 10 wounds. But also gets a 5 plus feel no pain as well. Meaning that it's going to be more durable than that streamer killer against quite a lot of anti-tank weapons. Its damage output isn't exactly the most outstanding in the world. Not too bad against medium or lighter infantry. The Psychoclastic Torrent is basically a strength 6 heavy flamer at 12 inches, auto hitting the enemy. And then its melees may be a fairly similar profile, though a bit random. D6 plus 1 attacks hitting on 3s, though it can get some boosts against injured enemy targets, potentially getting a plus 1 to hit with a feeding frenzy, and then a further plus 1 to wound as well against enemy units less than half strength. It's not bad, but with the amount of threat that this thing has, I'm not sure it's really all that worth coordinating rather than just trying to kill stuff. True to its name though, it does have absolutely massive anti-psyker rules. Those melee attacks auto wound psychers on a 2 plus with the anti keyword, and also has devastating wounds. It means on average you get around about 5 mortal wounds versus any enemy psyker, even really big tough ones. Grey Knights and Thousand Suns probably aren't going to like seeing this one on the board, both very tough and very dangerous against them. Otherwise, perhaps the biggest surprise on the datasheet after the 40k demo gamers is a 6 plus feel no pain type aura to any tyranid within 6 inches. On any individual unit, it's maybe not the craziest durability buff in the world, but I feel like if you can get this on multiple different units and make the enemy struggle to kill them quite as much, I feel like it really could be quite nice. If you're going with a bit of a monster mash Tyranid army, it could be worth having one of these in the ranks. Feels like it's unlikely to be the thing that's targeted first by the vast majority of enemy armies, and it could make a whole clutch of more dangerous destructive stuff a lot tougher. Beyond that though, maybe seems like a decent enough distraction unit, maybe not crazily dangerous, but perhaps a good one to try and soak fire with, compared with more valuable things in the army. Next up we've got the Barb Gaunt. I think due to their special rule they might be in contention for one of the strongest looking things out of this entire preview, at least if they're fighting infantry. You get Barb Gaunts in units of 5 to 10. They've got a sort of tier in a medium infantry durability profile, toughness 4, a save of 4 plus and 2 wounds, so a little bit harder to kill than regular Gaunts at least. You mainly get two things out of them, the damage profile of their bio cannon, and perhaps more importantly their disruption bombardment to slow down infantry units. The bio cannon's got 24 inch range, d6 attacks hitting on a 4 plus at strength 5 AP 0 damage 1, only really going to be all that effective against light infantry, though both of its keywords might amp up its damage a little bit, blast for extra hits on hordes and heavy for hitting on a 3 plus if you stand still. It will definitely be handy to have around in a horde matchup full stop. However, that crazy disruption rule feels absolutely brutal against certain matchups. Basically, any single time an enemy infantry unit is hit by a single attack out of any one of their bio cannons, that unit gets a minus two to move, advance, and charge rolls in your next turn. I kind of expected this to be an ability that you could just hand out to one enemy unit targeted, but it seems like it's basically fully de restricted. In theory, you could have a presumably quite cheap squad of five barb gaunts. Divide fire five ways and basically slow down an entire wing of your opponent's army. This looks like it could be absolutely brutal against certain slow moving foot melee armies, maybe on foot orcs for example, or durable heavy infantry advancing, say maybe Adeptus Custodes or various flavours of Terminator. For Death Guard Blight Lords and things in particular, it looks quite painful. In theory, they'd be moving in just the two inches with that. Obviously, we don't know their final points cost yet. But with their profile and the weapon stats, I'd be kind of surprised if Games Workshop charges massively for them just literally based on the ability. And I feel like a unit of these guys, even if they are pointed at a slight premium, is going to be a massively good investment against certain armies. I'd be kind of amazed if at least one score of these didn't wind up being kind of auto-include. Sure, they might not be helpful in every single game, say if you're playing Knights or something. But for those games when you can slow down an entire Custodes or Death Guard army to a crawl for a turn, that could be absolutely game-changing, maybe even game-winning. 
Next up, we've got the Chittering Horde that are the Tyranid Termagants. Looks like these guys are following a trend of reduced unit sizes. I really wouldn't be too surprised if units wound up capping out at 20 in 10th edition. The Termagants have certainly gone down to that, from 30 down to a max of 20 models. I do quite like the updated hordes for them. I feel like it's a solid update on their previous very dated miniature with all the mold lines. In general, their stats are largely unchanged. They do have objective control too, so having a big horde of them on an objective will be something that you need to kill if your enemy wants to take it. And then they do have their three classic weapon options here, Flesh Bores, Devours, and Spine Fists. I guess that these would be options that are coming in the multi-part kit when that follows up the Leviathan launch. Out of those, the Flesh Borers lost a bit of AP. It was Strength 5, AP-1 before. Now it's just Strength 5, AP-0. Though it did retain the Assault keyword, which really quite a lot of weapons lost, will help them get around the board. Spine Fists are 12-inch Assault Pistols with Twin Linked, two shots at Strength 3. Overall, with the reroll Wound Rolls, they actually seem fairly vicious for the damage output. And with built-in Wound Rerolls, I feel like they're the best of the three for raw damage. Then there's the Devourer, which has a bit more range. 18 inches and 2 shots at strength 4 and damage 1. Again, I feel like this probably beats the regular Flesh Borer for raw damage. Has a bit more range than the Spine Fists, though does lack Assault. From this impression, I'd guess they're probably all going to be costed the same number of points, though I suppose we'll see there. If they all cost the same, I think I'd prefer either the Spine Fists or the Devourer, though as a result of that, I could maybe see the Flesh Borer being a point less, perhaps. Hopefully the Flesh Borer Gaunts do remain good. It's the most iconic loadout, and Tyranid players are likely to be able to get their hands on loads. Otherwise, they've got that Endless Multitude keyword, which allows you to replenish a scary amount of these in two different units for one CP now. That's already quite a big deal, never mind if you might be able to target two units at once. And then their main rule is Skulking Horrors. Once per turn, when an enemy unit ends a move advance or fallback within 9 inches of them, they get to move d6 inches unless they're within engagement range. Just a tiny bit of movement in the enemy turn is a really big deal. A good chance to just basically move away from a charge and the enemy might fail it. You could hide behind terrain if they're nearby to shield them from shooting. Or you might even be able to push up to an objective or even screen an enemy charge. Loads of possibilities here and I feel like that's going to make these a unit that's just a little bit trickier to approach. Every so often that might do something massive even if it doesn't do too much most of the time. Overall does look pretty interesting. I feel like respawning them with that stratagem might be one of the best things that they can do. We'll be interested to see what the Turvagon can do for them when we see that. Next up, we perhaps have the big bad of the box, the Tyranid Neuro Tyrant. Build as basically a Zone Throbe Hive Tyrant with a massive great amount of psychic threat. This thing was voted the single most popular model in the box looks wise when I did that poll a while back. I feel like the Neuro Tyrant's data sheet is quite a good one. There's really quite a lot going on for it. First up, it does appear to be a leader rather than a lone operative or just outright exposed. It can either attach to Neurogaunts, so yes they do have a use and they can indeed shield this thing from harm, or it can attach to Tyrant Guard, as the other Hive Tyrants will likely be able to I suppose. Its defensive profile certainly doesn't seem awful though if you wanted to run it solo. Toughness 8 with a 4 plus invul save should keep it at least somewhat safe, though I'm going to guess that it will cost so many points that you probably will want to screen it. When it's leading a unit, the unit gets a flat plus one to hit. I guess that would include this guy, so I'll be hitting on a two in melee. And far more excitingly, if they target an enemy unit that's battle shocked, they also get a plus one to hit both at range and in melee. It means his psychic scream attack could be massively savage if you can manage to pair him with perhaps a screamer killer and put battle shock on a key target. Otherwise, stats wise, he moves 6 inches. I guess that's the same pace as the Neurogaunts, and I guess potentially the Tyrant Guard. A little bit on the slow side, ponderously drifting across the battlefield like a zone throw, I suppose. His leadership 7, plus, which doesn't sound amazing, but as Synapse, he's going to be testing on a 3d6. It is better than just about most units in the game. As mentioned, his toughness isn't too bad. A 4 plus invul save gives him a solid chance to just shrug off anti tank guns. For his actual damage threat himself, he's a lot better at range than in melee. 2d6 auto hits at 18 inch range, strength 5, AP 1 and damage 2. Perhaps a profile that's best suited to clearing 2 wound infantry like Space Marine Intercessors where he kills around 2 or 3 of them. It'll become a lot more general purpose though if he can get battle shock on the enemy target. A plus 1 to wound with that would make it pretty savage. In melee he gets 5 attacks at strength 5, AP 0 and damage 1. A little bit of anti-light infantry there but nothing too exciting. And I guess it's worth noting that his Neuroloids don't have any profile on this data sheet here. As Games Workshop mentioned in his last preview, they are basically just counters to mark where his cast is synapse buff. Maybe a little bit of a shame, I like the idea that they would be individual models with their own agency, but I won't deny that they are pretty cool counters. 
Then finally, he's got one useful buff and one big debuff, as well as being a synapse unit himself for units within 6 inches. He can also kind of cast synapse for a turn on a couple of units within 12 as well, meaning that they could potentially go moving away from him and take the fight to the enemy. I still be testing Battle Shock on 3d6 dice until the start of your next command phase. I feel like it's probably going to be most meaningful for units that are starting next to him in the 12 inches, as basically the buff will wear out just before they need to test Battle Shock next time, which is kind of counterproductive. Still nice to have though, you definitely want more in the middle of your forces for the 12 inch thing. Finally though, and perhaps one of the most interesting special rules, is that he comes with a minus 1 debuff to shadow in the warp. The Tyranid special rule where once per game they basically have a great big psychic shockwave sweep the battlefield and make everyone take a battle shock test, potentially making opponents not be able to score objectives or use stratagems and things. Apparently having a neuro tyrant on the board will give you a minus one debuff to that test. That means that space marines will be taking the test as if they had a leadership 7 plus and things like guard will be taking it as if they had a leadership 8 plus. This just seems monstrously disruptive. You could easily have maybe two or three more units fail Battleshock just because the Neuro Tyrant turned up. Overall, all round seems pretty great to me. An interesting enough blast of damage, flexible synapse for the center of your army, plus the big minus one Shadow in the Warp debuff. Obviously points dependent, I think he looks quite fun to include. Next up, we've got the mini Lictors that are the Von Ryan's Leapers. Basically a flavor of pack hunting Lictor with three to six models in the brood. They don't have any weapon upgrades or anything like that, but they come with quite a lot of cool stock abilities. The Leapers are Infiltrators, the one where they get two set up in the midboard, so often might want to start the game sat on one of the midfield objectives, holding it against the enemy and maybe threatening a big counter charge against infantry. Could mean that if the squad does get depleted though, they might be a bit far from Synapse. I guess the idea is that they leap at you, but that movement of 10 inches really is pretty impressive I think. Really not bad for a forward deployment type unit, they could set up somewhere relatively safe and still potentially threaten a long charge on a key enemy unit. Toughness wise they seem alright, toughness 5, a 4 plus save and 3 wounds. They also have a 6 plus invo and a minus 1 to hit from stealth as well, making them just a little bit better against range damage and high AP weapons. In combat they strike with 6 attacks each at weapon skill 3 plus, strength 5, AP 1 and damage 1. Going to be good against medium and light infantry, but not very good against heavies. They won't be doing too much to tanks and vehicles with this one. I think it is interesting that they're one of the units that gets fights first though, meaning that if your opponent charges you, they get to strike before them, at least if they're selected first by the person who's defending. That's quite good charge threat protection, means that certain units just won't really be able to charge these guys credibly, maybe particularly things like toughness 3 infantry with one wound, perhaps this is a battle melee specialist for example. Overall, I feel like they look fairly strong for mid-board skirmish infantry. Pretty ideal for trying to fight and kill the units that are trying to take the objectives off them, or potentially jump into the enemy ranks and kill something important that's not all that tough. I'd say perhaps maybe the one disappointment about their data sheet is their unit rule. Their pouncing leap rule means that they can use the heroic intervention stratagem for free. That's the one to kind of counter charge an enemy unit that charges a nearby unit. But given that they're infiltrators, I feel like they're usually going to want to start up the board probably on their own. So I can't help but think that that's going to come up very, very rarely indeed. If and when it does though, it does definitely have the potential to be big. Force the opponent to have to deal with them as well as any unit that they're nearby. I guess it means they could potentially help bodyguard certain other units that might be easy charge targets. Overall though, probably not their main selling point. I feel like maybe small units of three of them to take certain mid-board points seems pretty reasonable, points dependent. Next up, we've got the new flavour of Swarm that's unleashed in the box, the Neuro Gaunts. These guys interestingly come with 11 models in the Leviathan box, 10 regular Neuro Gaunts and one Node Beast, the perhaps slightly bigger one with the glowing green bit that was painted on the Leviathan box plus the little spur on his back. As best I can tell from this data sheet and the army construction though, it seems that the Node Beast just doesn't really have any additional special rules. At the moment it looks like he's just a cool looking different Eurogaunt within the squad. Given Games Workshop's last preview, I don't think anyone was expecting these guys to be particularly dangerous on the board. They've got a kind of weedy gaunt profile with toughness 3 and a 6 plus save, so worse than the Termagants. They don't have any ranged guns and they've only got the Xenos teeth and claws that the Termagants have in melee. A single attack at strength 3, AP 0 and damage 1. Realistically, it looks like the main use of these guys are being ablative wounds for that Neuro Tyrant should you want to attach one to these. I guess they can help out with a little bit more objective control if it moves on to objectives as well. And they also have the advantage of kind of broadcasting synapse a bit. If these guys are within synapse range of your main army, 
then they themselves counter synapse as well, so they might be able to broadcast that boss to other Tyranids that are a little bit further away. Hopefully they're nice and cheap, because they don't really do all that much. With less damage and defence than the other swarms, I'd guess that these guys are going to be the cheapest out of any of them. Might be nice for throwaway screening units, or a unit to sit on a home field objective. Finally, we have that rather sinister Talon Winged Prime. Perhaps one of the de facto looking leaders of the box, certainly one of the Tyranids with a lot of character tearing that Terminator apart in the launch trailer. This guy feels like he's a bit of an okay skirmishing character, though maybe lacks the raw damage to tangle with anything particularly tough, and I would say it's not all that durable either. He moves 12 inches with his wings, he's got the fly keyword, he's got a toughness of 5, a 4 plus save and 6 wounds, basically the same as two Von Ryan's Leapers stuck together. He is a leader as expected, and either leads gargoyles or tyranid warriors with melee or ranged weapons. At least on this datasheet, there's no hints of tyranid strikes coming yet, though I think it's absolutely a possibility, given that we've basically got a winged prime, we certainly could see winged warriors. The most interesting thing about his leader rules is that it looks like the tyranid warriors datasheet is getting split in two. Probably one of them with underslung ranged weapons, and one of them that's just dedicated entirely to combat. Not too sure why they'd go that way. Perhaps it's just to make sure that one datasheet isn't too complex. Whichever unit that he leads, he'll give them sustained hits 1, which should be a nice solid 25-33% damage boost, somewhere like that. Though I kind of feel that none of these are real ideal targets for that. The Gargoyles just aren't really enormous threats anyway. And the Tyranid Warriors are kind of wasted to have the wings on, seeing as they'll be moving on foot, so they might well do better with a regular Prime. Wouldn't be too surprised if the on-foot Prime got a 3 plus save or something, perhaps in a bit of a mirror of the Hive Tyrants, and the Winged One being a bit less durable now. Finally, in combat, he's got an okay profile for skirmishing with light to medium infantry, 6 attacks hitting on 2s, strength 6, AP 1 and damage 2. Again, like a fair few profiles on this list, he perhaps seems best at taking out medium infantry like Space Marine Intercessors, he should kill around about 1 or 2 of those on average. With average rolling, he doesn't quite kill a Space Marine Terminator on average, I suppose he must have rolled quite well in the animated trailer when he ripped that one apart. Finally, he's got the special rule for a 4 plus chance to fight in death if he's slain before he fights in combat. Not terrible, but I must admit with the melee profile, probably not entirely exciting either. It's not going to be a unit that dies and then takes an entire squad down with him, maybe just one or two extra models at best. Overall, I feel like he's perhaps not the most convincing datasheet in the world, not unless he's super cheap on the points cost. Just feels like his main benefit is being a sustained hits one leader, and if the regular Prime gets that as well, then he'll probably do it better. If Tyranid Strikes really are a thing though, and they're pretty efficient damage dealers, then it might be a whole extra story. I suppose adding Synapse is a benefit all of its own as well. He could add that in the middle of a Gargoyle squad, so it could be a fairly cheap and mobile version of Synapse. I guess that could be another option to support an advance. Overall, pretty fun stuff for the Tyranids there, I think. Really cool to lift the lid on how these units are actually going to be playing in-game. Quite a lot of these look at least somewhat interesting. As always, until we get the points, we can't really say how competitive things are going to be, but I feel like the Screamer Killer with the massive Strength 10 and Damage 3 attacks looks fairly interesting as one of the more general-purpose damage dealers of 10th. The Barb Gaunts just seem brutal for that movement debuff against an infantry army, and potentially game-changing against certain foes. Turbigans look like nice little objective holders, with replenishing the unit and scuttling away when they get threatened, and I feel like the Neuro Tyrant and the Von Ryan's Leapers both look kind of interesting as well. Let me know your thoughts out of which of these you're most interested in putting on the board, or if you've seen anything else that I might have missed in these newly revealed datasheets. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics, and I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I shall be back in the not too distant future with a roundup of the Space Marine ones. Finally, if you've been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspex Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you're interested in helping support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.